part two. Um, last week, uh, we looked at an overview. So just to give a, a brief summary of that, uh, the Hebrew and Greek names of this book simply means what it says on the tin, Judges. Uh, the purpose of the book, it records Israel's deepening moral decline, a downward spiral of disobedience. Uh, brings judgment from God, repentance from the people, and then deliverance through God's appointed judges until the next cycle of the same. And they just keep doing that. So a theme might be decline, that kind of word, um, depravity even. Author, not so sure, not so clear, but possibly Samuel in approximately 1043 B.C., we see from the books of Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, that he was certainly capable of writing this kind of history, and it fits with where he fits in the, the history of things before the kings come. Uh, it's one of those things that we can't be too dogmatic about, but possibly Samuel. As for an outline to the book of Judges, we start with the disobedience of Israel, described in summary in chapter 1, verse 1 all the way through to chapter 3, verse 6. And then the deliverance of Israel with that cycle of the judges as they get worse and worse and worse from chapter 3, verse 7, through to the end of chapter 16. And then the depravity of Israel, which we'll look at this evening from chapters 17 to 21. So the second part, the deliverance of Israel, is about the leadership of Israel, really, in those cycles of deliverance, but about those bad leaders that the Lord used. Despite their own sinfulness, the Lord used these imperfect and wayward people uh, to accomplish his aims. Just shows more of how glorious and amazing he is that he can use sinners like us to achieve his aims. And as we look at the, the judges in the book of Judges, I think that can give us confidence that you know, if you can use them, he can use us. Um, so that was the deliverance of evil that we, of Israel rather, the deliverance of Israel that we looked at last week. So onto the depravity of Israel this week. Um, not much to say, I suppose, really, for these four chapters. From chapter 17 to chapter 21, the depravity of Israel, it shows us that the judges were not enough. That's what we saw in the previous section. They needed more than simply a good military leader. They needed spiritual direction and reform. Ultimately, they needed everything that the, the, the scriptures so far is pointing us towards as the Lord's plan for redemption continues in all the promises he's given so far he's been pointing toward the need for a king it's already mentioned back in Deuteronomy when Moses says when you appoint a king these are the things that you're to look for in Deuteronomy 17 and so it's all heading in that direction right from the seed promise all the way through to this moment it's showing us that God's people need a leader, ultimately, Jesus Christ, but even an earthly figure who trusts the Lord and will uh, temporarily uh, rule them and protect them. So anyway, chapter 17 to chapter 21, what do we see here in the depravity of Israel? We've seen the depravity of their leaders. And now we see the depravity of the people. In chapter 17, there is Micah's idols. Here we see that the people are getting worse. Uh, let me read some of this. So here is a guy who, well, I think it's best I read it. Now, a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. So this guy is admitting to his mother that he took this... Um, 1100 shekels of silver now 1100 shekels of silver is not just 1100 silver coins it's a huge sum of money one estimate i heard was like five million pounds so it's it's no small amount this micah had embezzled from his mother a massive amount imagine five stealing five million pounds from your mum. what do you think her response would be I wouldn't have thought her response would be this in chapter, in verse two. Then his mother said, 
the Lord bless you, my son. That's just bonkers. Why would she said, say that? When he returned the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. I will give it back to you. So after her initial ridiculous response of saying, God bless you for stealing my silver, she then says, let's um, consecrate it to the Lord and make a carved image out of it. Now, what does the Lord say about carved images? They are not something he likes. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, verse 15, cursed is anyone who makes an idol. There's two terms for this kind of metal work and making an idol or a carved image. And exactly the same phrase appears in this Judges 17 passage as does in that Deuteronomy 27, 15. So these words apply directly that this woman is cursed. She's doing the exact opposite of what God says should, should be done. Um, yet she's determined to do that. So he returned the silver to his mother and she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who made them into an image and the idol. And they were put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod and some idols and installed one of his sons as priest. In those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as he saw fit. You may recall that that refrain pops up again and again in this book. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. That story of Micah is an example of that, that in those days Israel had no king and everyone did as he saw fit. They were doing crazy things. They weren't paying attention to God's word. They were thinking badly. They weren't doing things right, like this mother's response to her son's theft and then turning it into an idol. It just shows the lunacy of their descent into depravity getting worse and worse and worse. But the story of Micah continues with a young Levite who seems to be wandering around looking for work. Now you remember that the Levites as their inheritance were to be given cities from the other tribes and so they should be well looked after by the other Israelites and this, the fact that this, is, this Levite is wandering around looking for work suggests that the Israelites weren't taking seriously their duty to look after the Levites. But anyway, Micah, with his newly installed idols, spots this Levite and gives him a job to be his, his own household priest, if you like. Then in chapter 18, uh, the, the Danites come along. Now, this is, the Danites are on the move. They're wondering, looking for a place to live. Uh, we haven't come into an inheritance, they say. This is all wrong, though, because as we'd already read in Joshua, the, all of the tribes had been given their land, their inheritance. So what are the Danites doing looking for somewhere to live? They're obviously not satisfied with the Lord's inheritance that he'd given them. So they're doing wrong in wandering the land. Why are they on their move? They have their inheritance. They're wrong. They come across Micah, find his silver household gods, and they say, that's nice, we'll have them. And they say to the Levite, who is his household priest, you come along with us too. Why don't you, instead of being a household priest, be a priest for a whole tribe? And this Levite shows his wicked ways in thinking to himself, great, I got promoted. Uh, he's happy with all of this. And so there is irony in this because Micah chases the Danites. He said, what are you doing stealing my silver? Well, where did he get the silver from in the first place? He stole it himself. So there's nothing really that Micah can say about that. Uh, you know, easy come, easy go in that respect. But this whole story of Micah stealing from his mum and her response and making a silver idol of it, and then the Levite being a household priest and then being a tribal priest and don't forget one thing that we'd learn as well is that the Israelites were to worship in one place where God said because there is one God there's one place to worship and we do it all together so this Levite was doing what was wrong as well the Danites were doing what was wrong going somewhere else other than the land that the Lord had allotted to them so these stories Micah the tribe of Dan and that Levite, it shows us the 
depravity of the Israelites. They're just not thinking straight. They're not doing what God had said to them. It, none of it makes sense. And that continues into chapter 19. Um, this is a horrific chapter. Um, if any part of scripture should be rated 18, it's this bit here. A Levite has his concubine, and uh, they go on a journey. And they, they stop in the city of Gibeah on the way to where they're going, uh, on his donkey with his concubine, this Levite. And he's got all he needs. He sits in the middle of the, of the town square of Gibeah, and looking like he's going to have to stay there the night in the middle of the town square. But a good man comes along and says, what are you doing sleeping in the town square? Come to my house. Please don't sleep in the town square. So the, he comes along uh, and spends the night at this old man's house. So from verse 20 of chapter 19, you are welcome at my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need, only don't spend the night in the square. So he took him into his house and fed his donkeys. After they'd washed their feet, they had something to eat and drink. While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house. Pounding on the door, they shouted to the old man who owned the house, bring out the man who came to your house so that we can have sex with him. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, no, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this disgraceful thing. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But to this man, don't do such a disgraceful thing. Does that story sound familiar at all? If you remember Genesis chapter 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, exactly the same picture of a man visiting uh, a, a, the village and wicked men surrounding the house and wanting their wicked way with the guest. There's no accident that the same language is used and the same story is portrayed. God is telling us in this that Israel itself had become as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? But they were destroyed, wiped from the earth. In fact, some say that um, the Dead Sea is the way it is because of the punishment on Sodom and Gomorrah that it effectively turned that part of the world into the Dead Sea. Israel has become just as bad as that one of the worst examples of sin, Sodom and Gomorrah. But it doesn't stop there, it continues. After the wicked men had their wicked way with uh, this concubine, the, the next morning, the concubine has managed to make it to the entrance of the door and evidently sleeps there, evidently dies there. As the Levite comes out to go on his way the next, do next day, verse 27, when her master got up in the morning, he opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way. There lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. That's an abominable story, a total lack of an ounce of compassion. Knowing what that woman had gone through during the night, which had saved his life, incidentally, didn't even ask, how are you? Didn't even check for a pulse. Just, come on, get up, let's go. And evident she was dead. Le a Levite, uh, one of the, the tribes the tribe, rather, dedicated to service of the Lord as set apart with this kind of attitude shows again the level of the depravity of the people of Israel at this time. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine limb by limb into 12 parts and sent them into all the parts of Israel, all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it said such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Think about it. Consider it. Tell us what to do. So by way of protest, the Levite does this. The remains of his concubine he sends all over all parts of Israel. And Israel is up in arms about it. How could this kind of thing happen in Israel? And so all chapter 20 is about the Israelites 
um, calling the tribe of Benjamin, where this village of Gibeah is that the Levites, um, that the Levite stayed in, who did this thing to this woman, all of Israel comes together to hold Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, to account. To start with, they just want the town to, or the tribe of Benjamin, to surrender those who did what they did. Chapter 20, verse 13. Now surrender those wicked men of Gibeah so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But Benjamin wouldn't listen. And so, long story short, here is an Israelite civil war. For the first time after they've come into the promised land, under the joint leadership of um, Joshua, and then they spiral out of control in their depravity. And then we come to this point, Judges chapter 20, where there is this civil war as the other tribes attack Benjamin. In the end, this all-out assault against Benjamin, casualties on both sides, tens of thousands, and there remains only 600 Benjaminite soldiers at the end with no families. In chapter 21, we see that the Israelites come to their senses. How could it come to this, that we would only have 11 tribes? If we do this, if the tribe of Benjamin's wiped out, then what about all the promises of God? We can't allow that to happen. They come to their senses, you might say. But they're short-sighted. They'd made a vow that they wouldn't, on seeing these 600 um, men left of Benjamin, they, they realized this, but they said, well, we're not giving our women as wives to them. Because of what they've done, because of this atrocity, they cannot have our women as wives. And so, again, we see the depravity of their thinking in trying to sort this out. Well, we've made this vow, so what are we going to do? How, how can they... Um, how can they have wives? How can the tribe of Benjamin continue to propagate? And so there's two crazy ideas they have in, in Judges 21. One where a village is wiped out, the men are killed, and the, the women, women that are left are given to the, the remaining soldiers of Benjamin. But we see that there aren't enough. So the second solution they come up to is, hey, every year there's this annual festival in Shiloh, the place where God wants us to worship. There's this annual festival. So why don't you guys, you Benjaminites that are left, go along, hide in the bushes. And whilst this festival's happening and there's women dancing, kidnap the ones that you like and then run away and take them. Crazy thinking. Uh, really bad idea but this is what they do to restock if you like the people of Benjamin so at the end of Judges chapter 21 verse 24 we have this bleak picture the leadership of Israel is a mess we've had the, the golden age of Joshua and they come into the promised land but then subsequent leaders subsequent judges get worse and worse and worse there's no king in Israel Every man does what he pleases. And then those last few chapters show us the deepening depravity of Israel in their thinking. Worse and worse and worse and worse. And in a sense, it leaves us at rock bottom thinking, what's next? But thankfully, it starts to change direction. Next, we come to the book of Ruth. When we start on the pathway towards God's king being delivered. First in David. And then ultimately, he's a picture for the Lord Jesus Christ. So next week, things get happier, praise the Lord, as we look at the book of Ruth, a beautiful picture of redemption. Any questions about judges? Leon, I've got a question. Great. You spoke about how the Israelites were supposed to worship in the place that God had designated for worship. How can we as a church today learn to worship God in keeping with ways that he has called us to worship him rather than allowing our culture and prevailing trends to sip into 
our services? Wow, that's a profound question that could be answered on so many levels. There's different strands to that. So let me start with Israel is Old Testament, and there are some things that were for Israel that are not for the church. There are some links together. At the end of the day, the, the people of God is Old Testament Israel and New Testament church. But not everything that was for Israel is for the church. So in that respect, it's clear that we're not commanded to worship in one specific place. To summarize that, or to summarize, I suppose, the, the main principle for us is John 4.24 that God wants worshippers who worship him in spirit and in truth. And so in that respect, um, I mean, you could take the spirit part two ways. There's two, understanding, two ways of understanding that. One, that we worship him in the general sense of the word spirit, that with all feeling, if you like. I don't think it's that. I think it's the other sense, the Holy Spirit, that we worship him in the power of or by the Holy Spirit and in truth. But what does it mean to worship in the Spirit in that sense? Well, it means that you can only truly worship God if you've been saved, because the Holy Spirit enters you when you are saved. So that bit's quite straightforward, that we worship in Spirit. What does it mean then that we worship in Spirit and in truth? Well, what is truth? But well, God's Word is truth. And so, as you rightly point out, we need to worship God in the ways that He has designated. Now, he doesn't spell out every single thing that we are to do and not do, but there are things that he says do, and there are things that he says don't do. Um, what am I saying there? That there are some things in Scripture about how we worship, but there are some areas of flexibility, and we need to know Scripture to be able to know what those things are. So what does that mean for us? Um, it means that when we worship, we, we have a gospel-focused uh, service when we come together. If we're talking about corporate worship in the church together, because remember Romans 12 says, to paraphrase, all life is worship. We're talking about corporate worship, are we not in this? So uh, where was I going with that? Um, we worship according to the Lord's ways in Scripture. Um, you see what I mean by there are so many different strands to this. One is that the world is not godly. And so to just bring in worldly ways won't do. Worship of God is a separate, holy, set-apart thing. So one thing, for example, is we don't... Um, Performance, music, is a part of our worship. But performance in this worldly sense is to a certain extent, and maybe funny a bit cynical, it's about the performer. Look at me, aren't I good? What I can do. And, you know, we like their music, and that's great. It's a bit reciprocal. But when it comes to the worship of God, the performer is not merely performing. The performer is worshipping, and it's not about them. They're pointing to God. They're leading us all in worship to God. And so their ego is to be out of the way as they point us to God. Why do I say all of that? Because some of the modern uh, worship music, some of the modern worship bands are doing so in a worldly fashion that says, this is about me, aren't I good? Instead of pointing to the Lord. I think there's so many ways in which I could answer that question. Is there any specific direction that you'd like that to go? Any follow-up question? You can, if you're speaking to us, we can't hear. Or are you muted? Can you hear me now? Yep, great. Um, to give a specific situation, say a church can't find a pianist to accompany the worship within the congregation or among other believers in the area. And there's somebody who's not a Christian, but they are a really good pianist and they're willing to play for money. 
would it be a good idea to put such a person in the service to play these songs or would that be blaspheming the word of God because they don't know God, they've not repented, but you know, we're hiring them to do this job. It's it's things like that that you know our church may face today. How would we go about dealing with that? Is that bringing the world into our worship? I would say so because that person wouldn't be worshiping, and so how can they lead us in something that they're not doing? I would rather have no music than an unbeliever lead us in in worship because they can't lead us in worship. They, they don't understand the dynamic. In that respect, it's about them and their ability to play. It's not about let's together worship the Lord. So in that respect, um, I think our policy here, I would go further actually. And I think, I don't know, would I? Uh, off the top of my head, uh, maybe getting us into trouble, me and Neil, by saying this. But I wonder if our policy should be, would be, that those who who lead us in, in worship as musicians should be members of our church um, or should at least be known as members of other churches. So, for example, if the Gettys came along, wouldn't that be great? We can confidently know that they are fellow worshippers as members of, um, of churches and good churches at that. So I'd be quite happy with them. But... Um, other than that, the only real safeguard we've got is if we know people are members of our church, then, you know, we, we know that they're saved. Does that answer that question? Yes, thank you. Great question. Leon, from your uh, study um, of judges, what would you say is the key takeaway for us in the 21st century from the book of Judges? The key one, because I think there are several, but I think the key one is that the Lord has his plan and it won't be undone by sinful humanity. He will achieve his plan anyway. Um, that That's part of it. Another part of that is he can even use sinners to achieve his ends. Sinners that have gone totally off the rails. So in that respect, we can trust his sovereignty. And particularly, we can trust his sovereignty to save. So that when, it, when that comes to our salvation, praise the Lord, it's in his hands and not ours. Does that an answer that question? Yeah, thank you. That's very encouraging. Thank you. Great. Well, let us turn to prayer. If you think of any other questions, do email or let me know on the phone or something.